Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> I still have to check the time because I'm still using the old time, but yes, it is good afternoon. And it's always, as I mentioned before, a pleasure to be here talking to everyone about this book. I would like to thank Kirsten for the lovely introduction. Yes, I live for that. Please ask questions. Um, and if I don't know, we're going to ask Emmanuel to come right here and help us with the answers, okay? Um, this is session five of uh, the book, that, uh, Thought in Life. Just a recap for those who haven't followed us thus far. Um, these talks are available, uh, session one, two, and um, session one, two, three, and four, lost count. Um, we are engaging, or tonight we will be talking about three more chapters. Every month we're covering three chapters of this book, where um, this evening we will talk um, about children, body and health okay very important and yes as Kirsten said every chapter is enlightening is um, captivating and it's you know it really makes us think right so try to take notes we like to um, take as much as possible from having to read however because of my ignorance I I don't think I would be able to go ahead and convey all the message that is on the chapter which is not our intent but it's definitely, um, um, the, we try to do as much as we can and not leave anything on the side. So besides being a presentation, um, we do read a lot so we can go over the content as much as we can and we try to summarize together, okay? We would like to, um, besides what Kirsten said and what Joanna Giangeli says as well um, on that reading, please bear with me, listen, okay? If I may say something wrong or misinterpret something, let's study together. <laughs> we can go back and study together. But there's a lot to learn from this. And uh, just so we can see here, it's important for us to go back and see what we cover because we will go back and we try to go back as much as we can um, with, when time allows to the previous chapters. We have talked about the mirror of life or will, cooperation, instruction, education. Tonight, we will revisit a, a piece of education. So, and, and, and we will cover tonight, as we mentioned, the children, chapter 13, 14, the body, and chapter 15, health, okay? So we're halfway into the book right now. If you haven't seen it, if you haven't watched, if you haven't read, we have copies now that we can always go back and study. And it's meant to be study, okay? And complemented by uh, some other books as we will see tonight. Um, However, tonight I would like to start in a different way here, okay? Which is with this beautiful question of the, the um, Spirit's book. And I put, I went ahead and put everything. We don't have to think the, the, the question and the answers there. It's from uh, our studies of the family ties, since we're going to be talking about children. We think about family. We think about this togetherness that we have, uh, entanglement that we have with our kids, parents. Um, so on and so forth. The question is, what is it that among the animals, parents and offspring no longer recognize each other when they, they, the latter no longer need care? We're talking about animals, but bear with me, okay? The Spirit says the following, animals live a material life, not a moral life. A mother's tenderness for her young has as its principles the instinct of preservation regarding the beings born to her. When these beings are able to take care of themselves, her task is fulfilled and nature requires no more of her. That is why she abandons them in order to occupy herself with more newborns. The second paragraph, pretty long, very explanatory. I wanted to read because we have that in, in, in our minds when we start studying the animals. But the first statement, animals live a material life, not a moral life. That is our difference from the animal kingdom to now where we're living in the human kingdom, okay? So we are all living a moral life. The reason we're bringing this here when we're talking about children and we're talking about the physical body and our health is because we have a different purpose. And the purpose is not to live only to our instincts. Responding to somebody's throwing something at me, I'm gonna dodge, right? Or somebody says something harsh at me and I'm gonna go ahead and just bite that person back. 
right? We have a different purpose. The spirits could have said, we are here to live a spiritual life. But the spiritual life would narrow us down, thing, saying that we don't need the physical body then, right? But they say a moral life to correspond to the natural laws that we learn as well, and we will see part of it in the Spirit's book too, later on. So we have a purpose, and the purpose is beyond what we imagine, that when we get up in the morning, we're already thinking about our bills instead of praying. <laughs> I do that sometimes when you know, we worry about something, it's like, oh my gosh, I have to get to this. And we forget about to pray, we forget about to take care of ourselves, we forget about to look around ourselves and see what's truly important. Right? So we want to engage in this talk tonight with this idea of purpose, of a moral life. All right? So we would like also to reference to one of the books that Kirsten have mentioned um, and Daniel as well on their uh, previous talk, which is the, this book over here, chapter 3 of the, the Family Constellation by Joanna the Angels that's also entitled Children. Okay? Very important for us to read whether we are children or not, okay? Because this is something that we would like to construct. When we're talking about children, it's not only for us parents, it's not only for us educators, right? But it's for adults as well. Because there is a fact that we're all gonna go through. We're gonna lose this body and we have to reincarnate. And guess what? We're gonna be, ch be children again. So perhaps a, is a preparation for the future, is a preparation for us to deal with the little ones in a different way now, right? So we can construct a better life. And for the children as well to look at it and say, perhaps I'm gonna be a father one day, perhaps I'm gonna be a mother one day. And I have now a bit better perspective on how to do it. Perhaps doing the same thing my parents did that was well done and not doing the not so good things that they couldn't do because they didn't have the parallels of life to, cheat, to teach or to multiply with me, right? So then we were more responsible for our acts. So chapter 13, children. Emmanuel goes back by saying that we are born with the moral legacy that we possessed before birth in the physical body. Remember last, we, last month when we talked about the cradle, right? That we come back and we bring that baggage, right? It doesn't happen. Mothers, they already know. <laughs> it would be nice if the kid could come with that little description, okay, this person, this, that, this person, this, this, and so on and so forth, so we can actually go back and readdress those issues. We don't know. We do not know. And that's pretty, pretty tough. We can, through time, analyze these, the behaviors, analyze the wants, the needs, and all those things, and kind of figure it out. Okay, when I'm saying figure it out, figuring out things out is not easy. <laughs> Sometimes it takes a lot of time, a lot of dedication, a lot of work, right? A lot of energy. Patience, forget about it, right? But we bring this with us and we already know. So a lot of this is going to be a reminder to all of us, but with the intent uh, and with the, the, the purpose behind that sometimes we lack. Because sometimes we think that, you know, we have kids, it's just to procreate, it's just to follow the status quo of life, right? But we bring this with us. And with it, right, as Emmanuel says, yet a child will also receive mental reflexes of its parents and teachers. Remember that in pre previous chapters, we we're talking about these mental reflexes. And everything that Emmanuel talks about is around these mental reflexes that we produce and consequently we receive back, right? So it's a, current, um, a constantly exchange of energy that we are putting out there and we're receiving, right? It's, it's never like, oh, I'm sending and I'm not receiving anything back. So whatever we say, we are responsible for. Whatever the other person says or does, they are responsible for it. We may feel the impact, but ultimately each one of us are responsible for this. So our child, the little ones that comes with us, they're going to be receiving these impacts as well, these mental reflexes. Undoubtedly, education enriches a child's capabilities in its new phase of life on earth. It should be remembered, however, that the written word is not as effective as the spoken word of personal examples. Education. So 
how can we educate children if we were not well educated? We just mentioned that perhaps I received from my parents certain things that they were not so wise. And I'm not blaming them. I'm not blaming them. What I'm trying to say is that I have to kind of look at the context, right? Who was my father? Who was my grandfather? Who was my grandmother? Who were my uncles? That also is addressed right over here in this book. I have to kind of look at the time. I have to look at the moment that they were living together and see all these things, all these little components. And we should go back and rescue this from our families. Religion, right? Some of them did not have enough means to carry on life and they were upset about it, right? We get upset with certain things that happen in our lives. Do we think that it was any different then? Perhaps much harder, right? So we have to take all of these things. So how can my parents, how I can, I can ask my parents to have given me things as a child, right, that they did not receive? Now it's the same thing with me. How can I give it to my kids? the things that I did not receive. The care, the love, the considerations, right? Being understanding, right? Some parents are, you have to do this, you have to do that way, right? All of those things, it's pretty hard. So that's why we go back to the chapter that we mentioned. If I can find it over here, I know I marked it off because I didn't want to be looking for. There is one part of chapter five entitled education, as we saw, that talks about the process of education, and Emmanuel says the, the following. Again, we say, the human mind is a mirror of light which projects and assimilates rays. However, this mirror is more or less a prisoner of the thick shadows of ignorance, just as before excavating a precious stone is encrusted by subterranean sediments. In order to be able to give off celestial irradiation and project its own brightness, it is indispensable to cast off this layer of darkness through a process of perfectioning and enlightenment. In other words, the old things, let us trash it. Let us put it away. We have that reference, the negative reference, because we already received those reflexes. But how can we move on? Put it aside. It's that reference that you don't want to use, even though you know that it's there. Leave it aside. And we have to move on looking for new grounds, right? Taking those, the bad stuff out and bringing new things in. Emptying our cup, our cup to, in order for us to go ahead and grow. So that is education. That is important for us by personal example. We can't ask without doing it. We can um, 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 demand anything, obviously, if we're even not trying to do so. This is because the voice and the practical actions contain a great deal of inductive magnetism that is immediately released by reflective action. This produces significant transformations, good or bad, according to the nature of its manifestation. Reflexes again. And he's explaining to us the reason why what imprints that mind that is very subtle still, I'm talking about the children, Right? When you do something, when you have that action. Because saying, again, words, as my uh, father-in-law used to like to say, um, the, the wind will take. <laughs> it will travel with the wind. Right? Sometimes we say things a million times. Until we do it, until we prove that is a second nature for us, it's not going to happen. It's not going to be changed for the, for the kids either. So steps, baby steps. This is not only for children. This is for us. This is for the children to become parents one day as well. All right? As we were saying earlier, it would be nice if the little bird is bringing the kid and bring also the baggage and saying, Leo has this problem, Leo had that problem. Be careful, Leo. He will try to do some crazy things. <laughs> right? But it doesn't. It doesn't happen that way. And Emmanuel says the following. We cannot, therefore, overlook the fact that, through, that though children on earth bring with them the effects of their experiences acquired through various incarnations, there are companions who come back to share our company for a time. They often do so in order to make readjustments with us as is demanded by divine law, for they as well, we, as well as we 
need these trials and lessons that we all experience during the task of our regeneration. It's for us, parents, educators, people who live alone among children. When we see children, let's get together with them. Let's be near them because it's an opportunity to readdress things of the past. Not necessarily perhaps with that spirit, but we can readdress things. We can teach, and by teaching, we're being compassionate, we're also being charitable. So these companions that, we're now, that we have now are companions from the past. It, it, Joanna the Angels, are, she's very, very um, explanatory when, when it comes to, down to the children in her book, talking about perhaps these are friends, lovers that we had in the past. We will see an action reaction by, by Andrea Luis through the hands of Chico Xavier as well. Problems that we have with family nowadays or problems that we had before. That affection that perhaps we have with one individual and not so much with the other individual. It's hard to say, right, for, you know, for, it's hard to understand for a parent to not love one son or daughter more than the other, but to have a different feeling. It's really strange. It's hard for, I, I believe, to comprehend as being a father. Imagine for someone who does not have a kid, to un that does not understand that type of feeling. But it's kind of strange, but it happens. So where does that feeling come from? Where does that, quote, unquote, preference come from? The kid haven't done anything wrong. <laughs> it's just a kid. It's just a child, right? So we have to acknowledge this past, this baggage that they bring and the baggage that we also bring. Now, who is uh, responsible for the wrongdoings in the past? It doesn't really matter. The point is, is that we have to re-educate ourselves, not the child only, because we also have our wrongdoings. So we have to make sure that we're working together. And Joanna De Angelis, again, she reminds us that this is an opportunity to be more compassionate. She even dares to say, with all her um, intelligence, her experience as a mentor, to, for those individuals that gets together and they have kids or a kid, that they're actually prone to live a happier life. Instead of living for themselves only, for the enchantment of the physical life. It's amazing to read this chapter, chapter three of this book as well. But let's go back and focus to this. There is also a very interesting passage of this chapter that Emmanuel says the following, to treat them, children now, as mere tokens of affection is to lead them into, a grave, into grave deceptions. It will render them inadequately prepared for their redemptive stru struggle when their body develops, they can become easily drawn towards minds that thrive in darkness and rebellion. They can therefore relapse into the influence of their past, a relapse that should be avoided and feared. And we see here the little child throwing that tantrum, right? Being disrespected. I deal with the public all the time. And guess what? I see it happening all the time. All the time. And it's sometimes, you know, you have to say something. Sometimes you just have to let go and, and let them deal with it, you know, the, depending on the situation. But guess what? If we live in a society and we want a better society, we need to say something. Not that we're going to go in there and slap the mother or the father in the face or something. No, I'm not saying that. But it's saying, can you try to be quiet? No, no, seriously, guys. I know it's funny the way I say it, but... You know, it's, look, because sometimes some people get really aggravated about the whole thing. I'm like, well, wait a minute. We had our time. This is their time, right? Remember, last, last time we were here, I brought something really interesting that I learned with um, Emmanuel, too, that being um, uh, compassionate and, and being kind is when we have all the right to say something, and we don't say nothing. We just, we just help. When I say say something, is that when we go and we, we don't judge. With, with the right of judging and doing something, we go and help. Because guess what? We have been on this road as well. As a parent and as a kid. <laughs> and as a kid as well, right? So I want to bring an example. And I have brought this, I brought this example already a couple times. And Kirsten and I, we did an, uh, did a, an amazing um, 
um, not a study, a pretty small presentation, 10, 15 minutes presentation of this book, Action Reaction. And it always comes to mind when we have this problem with parents and kids. It's on chapter two of this book that the mentor Druzo, he's addressing a crowd of people. Imagine, let's bring ourselves to that moment now where he's addressing a crowd of people, suffering individuals in Manson Pais, which is uh, coordinated or, or um, let's say, under the jurisdiction of Nasolar, right? And he's there talking um, to the crowd. And after he talks, he addresses the crowd on courage, an idea of courage to continue to work, to perhaps receive another opportunity in life, in the physical body, to receive the, the, um, the opportunity to readdress things of the past. That was the topic. So he addresses the crowd, and then this lady comes to him and says the following, okay? My friend, forgive me for interrupting. When can I leave for the terrestrial realm with my son, Paulo? I visit him in the darkness as often as I can. He neither sees nor hears me. He is unaware of his moral misery and continues to be authoritarian and proud. But I don't see him as an en my enemy. He is an unforgettable son. Ah. How can love contract such an enormous debt? And this is her asking Druzo, who was the mentor of Manson Paz again, coordinating that location to help these debilitated minds. She is suffering because of her past with her son. Now he's in a worse condition than he was before, and she's begging for a new opportunity. And then Druzo, I'm not only going to say the first paragraph that he explains what was going to happen. He says the following. Yes, said Druzo, a little ret reticent. Love is a divine force that we frequently degrade. We take it pure and simple from the life with which the Lord has created us and with we invent hate and imbalance, cruelty and remorse. And this strands us indefinitely in the darkness. As far as the law is concerned, it is nearly always out of love that we get entangled in mazes of bitterness, love misinterpreted, misused. He's not judging. He's just explaining what could happen when we, again, treat our kids as just tokens of affection. We give whatever they want. We, we let them say whatever they want. We don't coordinate. We don't you know, do things that we're supposed to do then things may get a little bit worse later on. Because we're talking about this uh, imprinting of this exchange of thoughts and feelings that perhaps it's going to generate and bring more damage later on to these kids when they become adults. If my kids see me screaming on the highway with someone else, what do you think they're going to do later on when they start driving? Right? I'm saying this because it happened to me. <laughs> I was furious one time that this guy actually did a, uh, a, um, um, a U-turn, um, um, what do you call, which he was not supposed to do. And nearly, nearly, and I say this in a good way now because I made my peace with the whole situation and with the guy as well, um, nearly got us killed. Not only the three of us, but him as well because I was, some of you already know, and I'm giving details of the, the, of the situation because it's, it's really something that we have to bring into our lives. You know, driving a truck, it was really, it was, it, was, it was a tough situation to say the least. At the time, I felt like I wanted to get out of the car and just run after his car. <laughs> I, didn't, I felt so angered that I want to run after him without the truck. <laughs> That's how it really I was. I started sweating and everything. I'm like, what is going on? And this was my way to the center. <laughs> my way to the center. And I started thinking about it. And right before we got here, I said, let us stop. Let us pray. Because <laughs> they look at me. It's like, yeah, you're really upset. I'm like, I am. Because the car came so close. The car came so close to one another that I was really upset. So. I start thinking, you know, they're going to be driving one day. They're going to do these things, right? So we stop and we prayed. We start saying good things. Maybe he was in a hurry, you know, so on. And we changed the whole vibration. The good thing was that I believe my mentor, because I don't put that on myself, you know, remind me that if I were to let that imprint in my fibers, in my mind, in my heart, 
this would then cause other issues later on. That's why sometimes we have this back issue, that you know, um, 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 uh, problem you know, later on, and we don't know where it comes from, what generated. But it's the same feeling that, or something that we have from the past. Education. Educate ourselves, educate others. He finalizes this beautiful way. This is actually a painting of uh, Madonna of the Coronation. Actually, all the paintings, all the, the drawings that I'm bringing today is by Leonardo da Vinci, my body. So um, this is, it's not, you know, I didn't mess up, say, Leonardo, the, you know, Vieira, it's da Vinci, okay? This is a beautiful painting of, of Jesus reaching out. You can hardly see the flower on Mary's hand, um, but it's a really nice painting just to um, bring to us. He says the following. So every child that is assigned to our guardianship is a living vessel, ever collecting daily images and experiences. It is therefore our duty to instill in children principles of justice and work, brotherhood and order, by accustoming children to early discipline and good deeds through the inductive power of our ex examples. In the spirit of optimism and hope, as we lovingly receive the child, we should remember that a child's heart is a precious urn that keeps collecting our mental reflexes, a trophy that will represent us in that great future in which all of us will live as heirs of our own deeds. Reincarnation. If I educate well now, if at least try to educate well now, I may become as their grandchildren. Can you imagine? Because I will be receiving the same pro the product of my actions with those individuals. It's hard to think, right? It's hard to accept that. But if we're in a spirit to send, we hopefully have this idea already embedded inside of us. But it's really neat to think that we'll get it, you know, get it come together again. And what I have done will then bring the product to all of us. Since we brought the idea of Jesus in the painting over here, it, it, this is really small, okay? The transition from one computer to the other got small. It, it's waiting to be reborn, but I'll read it from here. It's that passage when Jesus actually reminds those that were upset with the parents bringing the children for, for Jesus to bless them, the children. Um, and Jesus says the following, let the children come. The, it's on chapter 19, verses 13 and 14. Then people, brought, excuse me, then people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his arms on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked them. Jesus says, said, Let the children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. When he had placed his hand on them, he went on from there. What does this mean? Are we going to be children forever? No, we'll grow. We know that through Spiritism that there is a period of time right, until early stages of our adolescence, right, a little different from one another, um, but mere, more, more like the, the first ages of, um, the first years of um, um, teenagehood, right, we see that the spirit is still acclimating with the body and all those things, right, and then it starts bringing all the, the good stuff out. The idea here is for all of us, children, and parents to maintain this pure heart where we analyze things, we study things, we help one another, that we don't let ourselves be tainted with the outside, with the craziness that is going on. And I think this is all for all of us, since Jesus said a true uh, blessing, a true uh, teaching is for all of us, because we also need to re-educate ourselves in order for us to go and then transform other minds. So I think with this chapter, we see this calling for all of us. Remember, purpose. We're not having kids just to make society happy. We're not having kids because, you know, the grandparents are saying, you have to have kids. No, it's more than that. Sometimes we, we don't know why we had, we had kids. If you ask parents, they're like, we don't know. We just, we, we had kids, you know, tradition, right? But we don't know what's inside of their heart 
the want or the, 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 the wish of a mother to have a kid. And Joanna the Angel says, that is something inside of us that we already bring, sometimes already preparated or, or you know, put together before we reincarnate, that I'll go first and then so on will come, so on and so forth, okay? So we move on to the body. Purpose. <laughs> Purpose, okay? We're living a moral life, all right? Again, the uh, Retrieving Man by Leonardo uh, da Vinci, and we look at this beautiful drawing um, of the physical body there. He says that the physical body that we are stewards or, or perhaps we are uh, this, this um, tenant of, a, the, of the physical body. A tenant more like you know, when you rent a house, when you, are, um, when you have actually, when you buy a car, right? That car is you know, given to you or you have that, that capability temporarily because we know that that car one day is you know, you're gonna need something else. But he brings this idea of being a tenant of the physical body. And he refrains from going to details of, of the, the biology of the physical body, but rather as a spirit, okay, that is using this physical body temporarily to um, guide ourselves, to change, to help change others, and to do what we have to do to help creation uh, move along. So he says the following, and we're gonna get right here from the middle of the first paragraph. Rather, we will point out that the spirit is the tenant of the physical vehicle and consciously or unconsciously presides over the body's formation and main maintenance from the moment of its fetal inception. Most often, it does so under the protection and guidance of higher beings. In other words, example from the book Missionaries of Life, of the Light, we'll see several preparations for reincarnation in the spiritual realm, where spirits, guide spirits, they will come along with other um, other spirits that are about to reincarnate, and they will have a chart, literally, have a chart and say, okay, Leo is going to reincarnate. He's um, want to be tall. Okay, well, there's a price for that. <laughs> uh, Leo wants to do A, B, C in life. All right, there will be some energy that will be dispersed for such an act, right? And then it goes on and on and on. They may have to make some corrections for us so we don't go to this route or to that route and we stick with our plan, right? We may not like it, <laughs> but it's there, right? We may not like it, but it's there. So we have this guidance. The point here is that we have a guider, we have someone who is meeting with us and saying, this is how you should do it. It's your choice. Now, will everything go to plan? Perhaps not, we're not perfect, right? But if we do our work, most of it will go, to, or sometimes we do even more, right? Not really. <laughs> it's not the, um, the, the, the rule in planet Earth right now, but many of us that perhaps can be more completers or accomplish more things than we have, have promised to ourselves. Because again, we're not promising. We think that we're promising to divinity. God already knows that we will be perfect one day. It's really to ourselves, right? And then he continues by saying, upon reincarnation, the spirits bring within the sum of to the, excuse me, with, with it the sum total of its good or bad mental reflexes according to the harvest of useful or damaging deeds it had previously shown, sown. The spirit incorporates the cells of the developing body to the patterns it carries within its structure these patterns will become part of its life on earth, beginning with the very first cell. Remember when we said this idea of imprinting, right? This reflex, these mental reflexes in ourselves. Now he's going to the first cell that we are giving, that through these reflexes, it's going to multiply and be molded with these reflexes. So, sorry to say to you, what you have, it's your product. <laughs> it's our product. And I say two things, our, your product, which is I'm responsible for this physical body as well, 
and what I've been going through with this body now, but also we are collective responsible because we are exchanging reflexes. So you, Leo, you're saying that I'm responsible for this person to be this way or that way or that way. Well, perhaps not directly, but indirectly. Because if we start to send good vibrations out in our environment, naturally those will change as well, directly or indirectly, meaning the person will follow the things that you're doing. That's directly, right? Indirectly, that perhaps somehow that environment will impregnate those cells that are being created by another mind and they will receive that impact as well and not be as difficult or have issues that perhaps sometimes we can have. So we are responsible for one another. But most of it, most of it ourselves. The body develops by means of these cells that multiply and organize around the spiritual matrix like iron filings, filings around a magnet. In the beginning, cells are formed by the blastoderm from which emerge the intestinal duct, nerve and skin tissues, bones, muscles and blood vessels as they start developing from that one cell, one little cell, right? The tenant, somebody comes to you and say, okay, I'm gonna give you this. Now it's up to you. It's really up to you to construct the best house, since we're talking about you know, being a tenant. You're gonna construct the best machine ever. Put your best effort into it. And we deceive ourselves. Right? We deceive ourselves because sometimes we don't know any better, but we have this help. It's amazing how Emmanuel brings this idea that we have this guidance, <coughs> that we're not alone. So what we have has been assisted. I like to believe that each one of us have been assisted by a higher mind that gave us what is necessary for us to be a happy camper here, a happy tenant here on earth. Soon afterwards, in this process of spontaneous development, the spirit finds itself materialized on the physical plane, dwelling in, the, in a body through which it can manifest. This vehicle is formed of billions of cells or microscopic individualities that are adjusted to the fine tissue of the soul and share its electromagnetic nature, like a complex machine shop with billions of tiny motors. They are driven by electromagnetic oscillations of a specific wavelength which emit their own radiation and assimilate the radiation of the plane in which they are formed, all are under the command of only one director, the mind. So we think that it stopped, this idea of reflexes is stopped at birth, right? Or uh, right after, right, right after um, conception. No, because what happens? Thousands and thousands of cells die and Thousands and thousands of them multiply. So what is your mental reflex right now? What are you thinking? What are you feeling? Those cells, when they're multiplying, and we'll see um, a little bit of it here, they're multiplying exactly with the vibrations of what you're thinking, of what you're feeling right now. You can't run from that. Or let's say they cannot run from, from that. Microscopic, as he says here, individualities. They are responding to the same things that we're thinking. So if I get up in the morning, it's a brand new day, upset with life, those new cells, they're multiplying, they're multiplying the same way. We want to be healthy, and we're gonna talk about health. This is still the body. <laughs> this is still the body. We're gonna talk about health. We need to think healthier. We need to accept a healthier life so that these microscopic individualities, when they follow this process of multiplication, they multiply in the same vibration. I mean, even red, but now it changed. <laughs> there are some beyond the grave, and this is the part that I want to actually, I'll stop right here. I want to, I want to, um, this is pretty intense, if I can say this way, this part of the book, and as Drusel also mentions when in this chapter two, don't think this is not for me, okay? This is very much for me and for all of us, um, especially for us who are presenting this, right? Um, 
because when we read and we study these things, we also have to put into practice. But let's see what Emmanuel says. There are some beyond the grave that are very unbalanced because of problems caused by suicide or murder, crime, and other vices. In their rebirth, they, at their rebirth, they immediately display painful derange, derangements caused by the vibratory malfunction of cellular pathology. Reflexes, guys. It's not that God is imposing anything negative to all of us. It's just a matter of us, the way we are thinking, the way we are vibrating. So it's a consequence of our own way of life. Infirmities that are of congenital nature are nothing more than mental reflexes of an unfortunate position assumed in the near past, demanding a return to the flesh, something only briefly for the treatment of the disharmony. Other variations of these past mental reflexes also affect our rebirth in the body, mutilations, mutilations, excuse me, and diseases are stored, entertained in the form of hidden guilt and remorse. They germinate at a predetermined, predetermined time according to the law of action and reaction, which rules watchfully, surely, and with precision. This is the reason that oft, very often, in accordance with the events programmed before birth, in the process of restitution, a person is visited by unusual trials, even during material prosperity, or by painful physical disaster when they were enjoying perfect health. Nevertheless, we must also remember that mental reflexes generate other reflexes, and that all payments carry their just share of mercy whenever the debtor shows their cooperation in the resolution of their debts. I wanted to read all the way down because when we start reading these um, trials and expiations, we think that there is no end to it or there is no way out. There is mercy, but we need to wish, we need to come closer to that mercy or to that way out, to the light at the end of the tunnel. If I don't get up, I just see the light, but no, it's too far, I leave it alone. No, it's not going to come to you. We have to do our part, right? We have to change our vibration in order for us to be rescued. Remember the diamond inside of the dirt? We have to clean it off, right? So we have all these things from the past that all of us, we inherited, we bring. We saw the last time when we talk about the cradle, when we talk about children, we remind ourselves again. So we have these things, right? And as he's saying over here, life can be perfect. Sometimes we see that, oh, you know what? I have a perfect uh, um, health, have no apparent issues that perhaps, you know, considered by society as an issue, as a problem. And then all of a sudden, what happens? The person goes crazy. The person happened, the person just went, no, guys, it's something that is inside, right? That perhaps we need to watch out, right? Or it presents itself in, in a very subtle way. Ideas or thoughts of negativity that sometimes we don't take care of it and it starts to multiply, 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 multiply. And then again, one more time, one day it explodes. Oh, it happened so sudden. No, no. We allowed ourselves to feed ourselves with the negativity, with the wrongdoings of life. We start connecting again by a specific uh, situation or by a moment of our lives when we got upset to feed again our bodies with the same thing. And then we inflame or we bring about uh, the um, abnormalities of, the, of our past. But we want to finish this again um, in, a, in a positive note, um, at least this chapter, and we're going to go on with the, the second chapter, the third chapter, that is the health, talking about purpose again. When we see that how can the soul that has, this is on the Spirit's book, I'm sorry, how can the soul that has not reached perfection during the, its corporeal life complete the work of purification? And I'm going to read the second question that comes after that, that we want to analyze again. What is the purpose of reincarnation? Going back to the purpose, why do we have a physical body? It's just meant to be that, you know, we got a physical body and here we are 
reincarnated again, watch one another, you know, reading this book? No. By submitting to the trial of a new existence, so we have this new existence in order for us to perfect ourselves. And the purpose, again, is expiation, expiation and humans, humankind's progressive improvement. Without reincarnation, where would justice be? How can we, let's say we go to school and you know, we study, 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 study a book, take all the lessons, and we say, now I know this. Well, we've got to prove it, right? Unfortunately, our system today is just a little bit <laughs> backwards, if we can say that way, that it's question and answers, right? That we have to prove that we know this way. But things are changing, and we see now that you know, you're, you're, you're in, the, in the, the school system, the teaching system, that, or, or learn, teaching and learning system, that we're given the opportunity to explain ourselves. It may not be the same way that the book was explaining, but it will be in a way that we can comprehensively say that this is how I see what I learn, right? And it's the same thing in life. We can read this book together, and each one of us will have our different takes on it, right? Or some of the things will be more important for us than others. But it's beautiful to say that it's the humankind's progressive improvement. So each one of us, since we're talking about this exchange of thoughts and feelings, we are responsible for this improvement of our society. The little that we do, it's important. And Emmanuel, um, Emmanuel finalizes by saying, the continuous and untiring practice of good deeds can alter the route of one's destiny. Since clear and righteous thoughts, which contribute to edification, will change the function of these diseased cells. Likewise, the same principles apply to human events where we can attract to our side by means of our improved and nobler mental reflexes the help, light, and support of others according to the law of solidarity. There is a way out, <laughs> but we have to change. And we are responsible for ourselves and for one another as well. That's one of the beauties of this book, that the responsibility uh, for ourselves and the responsibility for um, one another is always, uh, it may always touch in the subject that we are responsible for these changes. As we, whether we like it or not, we're, there is, a, there is a, a connection with one another, right? And again, illustration of this, perhaps, many of the other books, but one of the books that we mentioned today, Action and Reaction, we'll see that there is a connection. So we move on to our last chapter of, to, of this evening. We received this sealed over here. Tenet approved. <laughs> Before we reincarnated. We went through that list that I mentioned, right? right we got this, we got that, all right. We have, oh, that, that checks, all right, all right. And then we get that seal. You are a new tenant on planet Earth. Everything's well, you know, as we're growing up, we eat our vegetables, we do the things that we're supposed to do, right? And then we start messing up the, ho messing up the house. <laughs> the broccoli is not left alone. You know, we do everything when we were, you know, with children, right? Good children. And then we start messing up, doing things that we're not supposed to do, you know, with the physical body that we got, you know, the promises that we um, um, uh, said and, nah, eh, it's too hard, you know. And we start looking at the environment, the environment, oh, no, but this is so hard. Everybody's doing, right? Why can't I do, right? So all of these things we need to take in consideration. This perhaps will be the way that we can see such a thing. Let's see what Emmanuel says, besides of reminding us again at the beginning of the chapter that we are all tenants. We're all tenants. And it's a little bit heavy, as we can say, but there's a way out. Bear with me. <laughs> it's not all bad, but he's trying to help us not to fall into the temptations of the physical body. When, when we commit an injustice, our mind enters into a state of conflict. We endure not only the censure of repentance, but also the vibrations of sorrow and accusations, both from our victims and those who sympathize with him. This initiates an intense disruption within the soul, which in turn is reflected onto the physical body. 
we talked about the physical body, but he brings that the essence is not the physical body. He reminds that the essence is us, thinking spirits, right, with our baggage that perhaps we didn't leave behind, we bring with us, and we, we want to again bring about, right, and we insist on it, that if we continue with this, it's going to imprint, it's going to reflect in our physical body. A dis disruption of this nature can result in maladies of various degrees and types, feeling of anger, despair, cruelty, and intemperance created morbid zones in one's organic structure. They cause a state of dissonance in the cells, which neutralizes nearly all their defense mechanism and renders the weaker organs a fertile ground for pathological, pathological excuse me, germs. That, that is why tuberculosis, cancer, lep leprosy, and ulcers are many times secondary phenomena caused by the imbalance of mental reflexes of one's thoughts. So, if we let ourselves, and we're going to see more, where he's not done yet, if we let ourselves in this world, even, even our condition to find our defense mechanism gets to be destroyed. So, who has the power? Who is powerful here? The physical body. We are, I'm sorry, the, the spiritual um, um, being right? Not the physical body. The physical body is only a consequence, a response of what we're thinking. I cannot do it. I cannot do it. I cannot do it. Guess what? You're going to be stuck in that bed. <laughs> the bed is going to like start creating tentacles. It's going to grab you. You're not going to be able to get out of bed, right? Or you're going to be in that couch because you told yourself a million times, you don't want to do it. You don't want to do it. You don't want to do it. Who can change it? Somebody can come over there again, slap you in the face, right? Since we're talking about <laughs> slap in the face again, or push you, you know, pull you out of there, push you off the couch, whatever, push, pull, whatever you want to do, or you want somebody to do it to you. But if you don't get up and do it, it's not going to happen. And the more we do it, the worse it will be. The consequences will be worse. Now, we're talking about here as if we were to do such a thing right now to our lives, right? Now let's take it this back and imagine this mind of negative thought or heart of, of, of very detrimental feelings, right? Over a long period of time. What is going to happen with this individual with the grace of God when they reincarnate on earth? We're not judging. We're just analyzing what a thought, what a action, what, what are the consequences of a specific actions that over time became repetitive? That's what we were trying to alert one another here. Look what this guy is looking at and the big question mark. Emmanuel says the following. All states of mental depression affect the cells during mitosis and introduce disrupting elements. On the other hand, neglect of proper nutrition can also lead the body into conditions of great suffering. And I dare to say here, he's not only talking about the physical nutrition, the food that we eat, but the nutrition of the mind and of the soul as well. While in the flesh, our cells will naturally reflect the substance we ingest. And in this process of continuous exchange, we also ingest countless disease producing bacteria, which comfortably lodge in our cells, and which may produce a wide variety of infectious diseases. But the pathological process does not always originate from such visible causes. Our unhealthy emotions, when deeply seated, can also create disease. Anything that you guys would like to highlight on this? Wait, hold it, because I have one. When deeply seated, remember when we say that repetitive thought? The, so there is, a, there is a, a, a before, the during, and the after, right? If we have to, if we can analyze that way. Because things can be rooted inside of us so badly that it's almost, it looks impossible for that situation to change. 
because we said it so many times, we did it so many times, that at this point, intervention must come. And it comes. <laughs> it comes. But it's important for us to look at these things, folks. It's not, Emmanuel wouldn't put this, this manual for us here on earth by chance, without studying, without analyzing different um, situations, examples, and we have several of them here already. We can consider ourselves examples, living examples as well, because we feel this way sometimes, that we, there is no way out. But everything starts from here. When I say from here, obviously our mind, we point it to our mind, we point it to our, our hearts, it's inside of us. It's how we vibrate. There are a million things for us to post online, but what we choose to post or repost the negative things, right? Social media nowadays is the best way for us to um, exemplify this. There are a million things, negative things over there. Do they pertain to my reflexes, right? To my actions? No. I look at them, doesn't touch my heart at all. Sometimes I may get upset, but I know that I have the power to do different. And I will go, I'll go and repost something that is enlightening, it's helpful. Same thing in our lives. Why say something that is gonna be detrimental or that's gonna hurt someone? Say something positive. If you can, get away from it <laughs> because you're not gonna help. Just our indignity sometimes about certain situations, it's not gonna help. And that vibration, it will be felt. It will be felt. So we're talking about, again, this health of the physical body, of our mind, of ourselves. Because everything that we do now, we generate a consequence later. And who here would like to come back in a new physical body, as we just said, with that stamp of, you are a new tenant on earth, having to reap poor choices now? Wanna raise your arm? I don't think so, right? We don't. If we were to choose right now, the next life. Have you thought about that? What do you want to be the next um, life? I was joking with my kids the other day that um, I want to be a um, marine biologist, right? And then I, it dawned on me that perhaps, okay, eh, eh, start making some calculations. I was like, eh, perhaps, you know, the, the oceans, the way we're going right now, it's going to be pretty dirty, so I'll have a lot of work to do. <laughs> so I started backing out, right, of my decision, of my choice, right? But then I thought again, yeah, there will be a lot of work to do, you know? I'll probably do have to do some, some hard work there, but it will be something useful, right? I was just joking with them and start thinking about what we are doing now and what we will see later, right? The amount of trash that is it's a side point, but I just, you know, trying to help here for us to focus on this idea on what's next. Um, the amount of trash that we're, you know, throwing out there, you know, in our oceans, perhaps we won't see anything. The way the, they call it um, coral bleaching, right? The, when, when the corals, the coral reefs, they start dying, they go white and then they completely vanish, right? The point is that if we don't do the right things now, later on, we'll reap the consequences. We will reap the consequences. What do I have to do since we're given this example of trashing things, throwing trash in the ocean? We're, I don't know how many miles from the ocean, right? But the things that we use in our houses, right? The plastics that we use and we don't dispose it properly, right? We can help to bring again the idea that we're all connected. Almost at the end, um, after negative feelings are converted to mental vibrations, they turn against us to disturb the complex function of the nervous cells in the skin, the digestive organs, the medulla, and the brain. These cells perform highly advanced technical functions. The reflexes of such lower feelings when poured upon the encephalic cortex can produce delusions that may range from a hidden phobia to outright insanity. This condition is reinforced by companions who are in or out of the flesh, who have an affinity with us both in their outer behavior and in your qualities. 
They affect us directly or indirectly with negative suggestion, thereby leading us into deplorable symptoms of mental alienation and obsession, even when we may appear to be spiritually health individuals. Great point for us who are studying the our spirituality, because when we look at it and think all of these things and say, okay, this is me, this is the little group that I work with or that I live with and is centered. No, what about this spiritual beings that are accompanying us? They don't have the physical body, but they attune, they connect with us through the same vibrations, right? And they're gonna make it worse. Or they can make it better if we're thinking and feeling positive things, if we're allowing ourselves to do the right things right now. It may be worse, it may, it may be difficult because the connections that we have with the past, it's not just the, uh, the, the baggage that we bring as far as our deeds or, or uh, misinterpretations, whatever of life that we bring from, from the past, but it's also our connections from the past and they come with us, they connect with us. Some other individuals that may be even reincarnated already too, but we're connecting mind to mind. Those are sometimes represented by the dreams that we have. Well, I don't know this person, but we had such a good affinity. Well, we're connecting, right? Mind to mind. But when we change this behavior, perhaps we also regain old companies that want us well. Let us not forget then that only good sentiments produce good thoughts. Otherwise, the soul becomes ill from lack of inner harmony and imparts on the body imbalances and disturbances of the flesh. Change the vibration. You change everything. What is the purpose of reincarnation of spirits? To finalize. The questions are different, guys. We talk about purpose, but the questions are different. Just so we can go back here. We ask, how can the soul that has not reached perfection during its corporeal life complete the work of purification? What is the purpose of reincarnation? Here, we're going back and studying again the purpose of the incarnation of the spirit. God imposed the incarnation for the purpose of leading spirits to perfection. If you don't want that as a purpose, I'm sorry, I don't know what we can offer. But it's pretty serious our perfection. So if I can do everything that I can do to reach this perfection, that isn't according to the law, because sometimes, you know, people will try to take shortcuts, but those shortcuts in itself, they're not connected with perfection. We can do so. We will do so. For some, it is an expiation. For others, a mission. When we say expiation, again, it's again this readdressing of the past, right? That in and itself, we also find that the grace of God Right? The ability to rehabilitate, the ability to learn new things, to share new ideals, and for some, a mission. When we perhaps are taking care of the little that we're supposed to take care of it, for example, me as a father, putting food on the table, bless you, putting food on the table is a must, right? It's expected of a father, of a mother, of a, someone who is you know, um, taking care of a little one to put food on the table. The education. Let's say the individual is doing everything that he's supposed to do in those content, being a good um, a co, um, co work at work, right? In society, doing the right things. And then we find another endeavor to help. Those are the extras. Those are missions. Because the rest is just taking care of the consequences of the past. That's when we enter this, these missions. One example. However, in order to reach this perfection, they must undergo all the vicissitudes of corporeal existence. Therein lies their expiation. Incarnation also has a further objective, which is to place spirits in conditions where they can do their share in the work of creation. One more reason for us to do our part. We are part of creation. We talked about this... Um, I believe two sessions ago when we were talking about the father and the prodigal son when the son didn't see himself as a son he saw himself as a slave one of the workers of the of um, the father's um, 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 
business, right? He didn't see himself as a son. He saw himself as one of those individuals who work in the farm. He didn't accept himself that way. And sometimes we treat ourselves the same way. We shorten ourselves thinking that we're just another individual in the whole universe. No, we are creations of God. And when we start thinking that way, number one, we start getting closer. And then I think, okay, if, I'm, if I have a purpose, even though I may not know it directly now, right? But by looking around, I see the things that I need to do to accomplish, then things start changing. And I want to do well. And if I want to do well, then I'm changing the environment. And then things just grow from there and there. Right? We're not going to even talk, talk about the negative when we do something negative. We're going to stick to the positive. And that is the idea behind this whole thing of changing ourselves. We come as a, as a child, right? We have our um, take on what our parents were, what they could offer us, the good things, because they did good things for us. They give us the ability to uh, reincarnate. Kirsten um, and Daniel evaluated this very well in the past two sessions, right? Especially Kirsten last week. And we take the good things, we apply it, we put aside the negative things, not applying them, <laughs> not repeating them, right? And understanding that we are the tenants of this physical body and we ought to do every single thing to maintain a healthy body, right? I wanna just propose something else that we need to think that these cells, these little beings that we are um, utilizing right now, they're being our little donkeys inside of this body, the trillions of cells that we have nowadays. Imagine our respons um, responsibility with them throughout time. Not just now, throughout time, right? All the organs, the tissues, everything that we have in our bodies, our responsibility, because now we have the capability of discernment. They don't. They do things repetitively. Little animals. Let us just think about that. We're not going to go deeper on the thought, but every time we do something, or, or let's say we feel something, we think of something that is detrimental to myself or to ourselves or to others, let us remind ourselves of this. What is my responsibility with my physical body? Now that we understand that mental reflexes is what brought us to here, to this moment. Much to think about it. Hopefully, you have a lot of questions, as Kirsten mentioned. I invite everyone to read the book. There is actually a, several works being done online as well on the matter. Um, I like to say that you know, if you have any questions about the translation of the book, please let me know. Um, there are certain things that we need to readjust here and there. And I say this with a good heart, and I'm putting this you know, out there as well, because some people, they like to read certain things and say, oh, this is really, wait a minute. It was a good effort, okay? And if we have what we have, we have to lift our hands up to heaven and say thank you, right? But we have some copies here if you would like to purchase one and to read about it. For those who speak Portuguese, you can read it in Portuguese online. It's online, it's a, as a PDF, um, but it's a beautiful, let's say, analysis or help or guide, um, whatever name we want to give, that Emmanuel offers us as incarnated beings on earth. You may think, as I mentioned last time, you know, but I'm so old now, I don't need this anymore. Well, you need it. <laughs> because guess what? You're going to come back as children. <laughs> You're going to prepare again to reincarnate. So it's for all of us. On that note, we invite everyone to talk about the vocation, the profession, and society, right? There's a lot that we can go back and rescue as well. The law of society that we have talked about thus far too. Um, the profession, you know, what, how is important? You know, what's my take in, in that condition? And our vocation as well, our abilities, which is part of the baggage that we bring from the past as well. So with no further ado, I'll open for some questions, some comments that you may have. Um, 
it's so interesting that those, at least these two last chapters are so entangled. It's unbelievable. If, of course, he had this intention, Emmanuel, when he organized. Uh, but the, the, the example that you gave uh, reminded me, being in this physio physiology field, our body is such a refined machine mm -hmm. with all the controls, each step. It's like a, a beautiful computer program that you check each line mm -hmm. to see and go back to recheck, check and recheck. And uh, so if we lose this ability, this, this, if our cells lose this ability to recheck because the damage is so overwhelming, the flow of toxic things is so overwhelming, so our systems, either liver machinery, pulmonary machine cannot recheck and let it go past, past the, how to say, the test. Mm -hmm. You have to test each gear then the disease comes. Um, we have, the machine is all well built that we have what say the safety uh, trigger or whatever, safety <laughs> level, that you don't get the, the, the disease or the machine doesn't stop until you damage more than say 30%, 50%, 70%. You have this big safety uh, level. Also, but we have also this fine machinery, so you have to put together those two things. Mm -hmm. And we are unaware how much we're damaging. Also, when in your example, you said tuberculosis. Well, we are living There's with the bacillus inside of us. Right. It's, we're not completely in a sterile in environment, our airways, they all have it. The pathological uh, bacteria we all have in our intestine, mm -hmm. they're huge, they're terrible, but we are there. Very healthy. Right. But when we get unhealthy, when we lose the equilibrium, the pathological became much more stronger than the healthy one. Right. Or if we mistreat our body so much that those bacteria that, that they are okay to be inside our intestine, they cross the barrier and stay, it goes to the kidney. Or there you cannot have even one, one little tiny part, number of those that the intestine can take it, or if it goes to the blood. So I think uh, our immune system, if we damage all these control checkpoints, if we damage with our bad behavior, with our toxic be uh, lifestyle, either diet, mental, you know, thought, our sentiments, sadness. sadness, all this mental state, we start to damage, miss these checkpoints. Mm -hmm. And the gears, the little gears, we're going to be worn out, and suddenly the machine stops. Right. You right. know, so. Obviously, men of you is much better in the field of many, many years on this idea of the health of the physical body, of this, what I like to call using now the term of economics, the checks and balances <laughs> of our physical body, right, which I think it comes from this idea um, recently um, to understand some of this and to understand some of the teachings that we have. Obviously, you know my field is, has nothing to do with um, human biology, but I took a human biology course. And the, the, the frame of the course was homeostasis, right, that the balance that our body has with one system with the other, how everything coordinates with the other, us with the environment, with one another as well, it's amazing. And yes, 
to lose that capability, to be have these checks and balances, it's so detrimental to us that if we really were to pay attention, we wouldn't be doing half of the things that we are doing now. And and I, you know, reading and studying and discussing the whole thing, it's like I, there must be a God. <laughs> Yes, there must be a God. When we talk about the mitosis, the multiplication of the nucleus, we're talking about the, the, a, part, a part of the cell, of this microscopic being multiplying that damages the chromosome, right? With our thoughts, with our feelings. Why are we doing? It's easier for us to see the, the physical, right? Drinking this, eating that. But what about the thoughts? One thing will correspond to the other. So great point. Thank you. Take human biology because it will help. <laughs> Kirsten. Oh, gosh. Kirsten has a full book of notes. <laughs> yes, I, I've learned from my predecessors to take notes more often. Um, <clears throat> actually, there are a lot of points. That's why I think this book is so excellent to be discussed. But however, I'll spare you and I'll give you just two questions. Um, through listening in these chapters, we're learning a lot about how what we do and think and feel can affect not only our children in utero and as small children um, and us as individuals. So a lot of these things I feel like I was thinking to myself, people might be hearing this and fall into this disease of victimhood and they fall into this cycle of feeling guilty and feeling bad about themselves, feeling self-pity. So, and, so how do we get out of this loop of feeling like, coming to the realization like, oh my gosh, I caused all this, look at my life, it's terrible. How do I get out of that loop of victimhood and embrace um, what is and do our best moving forward? Like how do I get out of that mental loop? Question one. Okay. Hold the microphone. You can hold okay. the microphone. The only thing that I would suggest, and this is a personal way of seeing things, um, try something new. Jump out of the comf comfortable zone, right? Um, if you think that you can only run one mile, run two miles. If you, you again, if you cannot even run, start walking. Try something new, because the same. It's not going to get you anywhere. Um, it's hard for us to say such a thing when someone is going through the repetitive mind um, of the repetitive thinking, feelings, right? So try to do something completely odd. And I'm talking about simple things. If we have a methodical life of getting up in the morning, the first thing that we do is to go and brush your teeth. Don't brush your teeth. Brush your teeth later, okay? Because we don't want to exact. Not well, we can eat breakfast, but go outside, look outside, open up the window and say, today instead of going, I'm going to look outside, pay attention that you haven't paid attention yet. And we'll see that there is life, that there is coordination, that there is balances, in, right, in, in life that God already put forth or before us. We have to get our minds someplace else because when, you know, the, the, one of the things that we perhaps many of us have gone through, that we're going through such a difficult time in our lives that we cannot even think, we cannot even pray. And what we do, we ask somebody to pray for us, which is okay, there's nothing wrong with that. But we need to go out of that condition somehow. It's like you're, 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 you're doing things so uh, repetitive that you need to Call, you know, call your attention someplace else, right? And that goes on a day-to-day -day lives at work sometimes that we do the same thing over and over and over and we feel so drained that do something else, right? So I think that, and again, this is personal and I wish I had a, another way to tell you that if this is not enough to help you somehow, but this is a good question that Kirsten is asking because we leave ourselves in this position and then we feel that, oh gosh, God doesn't love me, there is no God. It's this person's fault, that person's, or it's my fault, right? So I think that we need to put that aside. Paula. Can I just share in this conversation? Please. Because that made me think of something. In order to break up a repetitive habit, which is really just stuck thinking, mm -hmm. 
like this book is a wonderful resource. This talk is a wonderful resource. But I think, just because I had a conversation with a lady today who just returned from a 10-day retreat in Germany, I think we should think of retreats, breaks in our schedule. We usually think of a vacation. I'm not against fun and play. But we also could think of a three-day retreat. We could think of a week at Lilydale. We could think of two days at a health farm. I think you need to put yourself into a special environment where you're with other like-minded souls. And then what you're doing here tonight for an hour and a half, you could do for a week. Mm -hmm. Then you would come out of it much more strengthened to change your habits. That's a good point, I, and I agree with it. I think that when we um, allow ourselves to repeat the good things in a longer period of time, chances are that once you get out of that, that one week schedule, you will be prone to do more and more and to multiply that, right? But I think that, the, and I thank you, Paula, but I think that her question is, how do we get out of it when you're in that situation? So. <laughs> I mean, the immediate way to get out of it is through acceptance. As soon as you've identified this reflexive mental habit, right. then instead of just repeating it, which is being a victim, you accept it. Acceptance is a profound turning point right? because then you quit judging yourself or judging whoever else there is. Thank you. We get stuck in Cartman's triangle. We're either the victim, yes. the savior, yes. or what is the, the third one? And we go back to it. Per persecutor. Persecutor. Yeah, we get stuck in this cycle. So I think it's, Paul, to add to Paul, it's difficult to identify when we aren't making, when we can't identify our own shadows, as Jung would say. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Leo. This talk was excellent. And again, I, I want to share in your contribution to study this book more. Go back and listen to Leo's talks before, because this book has, has great resources. I will say, to, just to add, I'm sorry, this is I'm hijacking a little bit this conversation. What Paula was saying made me think about a friend of ours. I think not just retreats, but changing our lives. We had a friend of ours who has a son um, who at the time was 18, graduating from um, high school. And um, at that time, he was quite rebellious and had some things going on. And he spent 10 months um, in this volunteer program where he was in AmeriCorps actually he spent 10 months and this program is so intense where you go and you're volunteer you know nine 12 hours a day you can't be on your cell phone you have no access to really the outside world you you're forced to work in this group with other people uh, in your peer group slightly older or around your age and when this young man came back 10 months later I didn't recognize him and I don't mean in a physical sense, I mean an emotional, mental, vibratory sense. This was a different human being. And I think because he was immersed in giving to others and it changed his thought patterns and it changed his behavior. And I think that those are the types of things that are good for us to do is to, as you were saying, get out of your comfort zone, do something good, do something different and look at life from a different perspective. Last question. Um, you talked about, I think it's chapter 13, uh, about, about children, and there's a lot to be learned about in that chapter. Um, but what can parents do if they weren't living their best life um, during their child's early stages uh, and during the child's early life? Because if we know what Manu was saying, that mental reflexes we are imprinting on our children, um, you know, what can what can parents do if they hadn't lived their best life, but now they recognize that? What can they do for their children now? Brace frame packed. <laughs> it's a joke, but when with the joke, um, thinking about it, um, you know, I actually have experience with uh, family members who went down that road and um, cousins and whatnot um, that we look back and we say, what went wrong, right? And what can you do? There's a way out, right? And the only way out is change of behavior, change of patterns. Um, and it's going to take it take time. It's going to take um, a lot of dedication uh, for those parents um, to instill um, or let's say propose the new beginnings for that individual who received those imprintings of life, those reflexes, and talk about it. I think it's important for for parents as well to talk about it and say, "Look, I made a mistake. I am sorry." The other example that I like to bring, I had a, um, a childhood friend who always sold his, his father um, 
in, in a completely different way what the father was really in day-to-day -day life. And once he discovered otherwise, things really went down for him. And the father did not have a chance to say, um, that, look, I'm sorry, I messed up. You know, I made a mistake. He continued to lead that life of, no, I did what I was supposed to do, I am right, whatever it is. And unfortunately, he didn't get to say otherwise to my friend because he passed. So I can imagine now the impact, that's why I said brace for impact, because he doesn't have to say, that, you know, there's no way to say it to him in the physical body while reincarnated with that individual, right? So if we want to change, it's going to be much worse, it's going to be much harder, but there's a way out. So this new behavior needs to start somehow. The thing is, is when we stop and say, oh, it's too late now, there's nothing that I can do. Yes, you can do it. Yes, we can do it. Ask for help. Go and put your word out there. There are people helping with this nowadays, right? We have examples here that we definitely can do it, but it has to start with that new behavior. We have to start with that patience, the resignations that we didn't have in the past, the courage that we didn't have in the past to say no, no, yes, yes. Now we have to do it. And many of us, we go through that because we're not perfect. So we can take a small example of life, right? And then multiply by the many misdeeds that the, perhaps these parents are doing. And when they want to change, it's just a little bit harder. But we have help. Paula. Um, <clears throat> what you just described is very powerful. I would call it like the healing conversation. When the parent goes back and talks to the child, it doesn't have to be a confession but it can be an acknowledgement of what they've learned and what they would like to have now in the relationship. <clears throat> the other thought I was just having, and this is coming from something you've said twice in the talk, that a person may say to themselves, oh, I'm too old. Well, I'd like to give the example of the current Queen of England. For someone who has continued to grow and learn, obviously in her 80s and 90s, because where originally she was following protocol and said that her son could not marry a certain person. Now with the current wedding today, we have seen such an evolution in the monarchy's openness and tolerance. So I really think we have to teach getting older as a beneficent period in which you can, yes, give to other generations from what you've learned, but you have the time. You're not like distracted by the daily paycheck anymore mm -hmm. to grow even deeper and make even more progress spiritually. Or besides the paycheck, I think Daniel had a question or comment, Daniel. Um, and um, besides the paycheck, traditions, right? Put aside the traditions and let's leave more by exactly. Daniel. No, I just wanted to add my comment about this talk. Very interesting, uh, this ch three ch chapter. But uh, we are talking about change behavior, we are talking about change with flags. So, but we always need to come back to the source of this, that is our thought. So this subject of change behavior and reflex is very complex. So I think everything that was put here, like the suggestion of retreat and, and change, you know, our, our behavior, our action is always valid. But at the end of the day, so we need to learn how to substitute our thought. And Joanna de Angel is very in the point on this because in the happy life she mentioned this. Mm -hmm. Substitute negative thoughts by one. positive one. If we do this, commit ourselves and do this like, okay, so there is this pattern of thought that I have. Let me work 10 minutes every day on that and try to see the other side. So it's a training, it's a process. And it's a beautiful book. Thank you, Thank Leo. You. Thank you, Daniel. And I, we leave with that, uh, guys, because many of us, you know, I go through this all, all the time. Um, that's why I mentioned work as well. At work, I, I seem to follow certain patterns, you know, throughout the day, the things that I'm doing. Um, I guess because of the analytical part of me is, you know, do A, B, C, this, you know, and you have the, the tasks that you have to do um, that I sometimes I was like, no, today I'm going to do this different. And sometimes I see very good results. Or, or I'm going to ask another person to do this. 
give them the chance to grow as well since I have the ability to do so, not imposing things on others, but inviting them to change their behaviors too, right? So give yourself that change. Do not let ourselves, let us not let, let, let ourselves fall into the pits that we saw here today, but to remind ourselves that our purpose is greater than what we think. It's greater than what we think. And it's, again, going back to God. This last week, uh, our God at home was talking about John of the Angelus brought a beautiful passage in the book um, Living and Loving uh, that reminds us about prayer, right? And one of the aspects of prayer, so beautiful, that is to get back or closer to God, get closer and closer to God. When we say, Dear Father, Mother God, if we can go back to that purpose every time we get up in the morning or before we go to bed or throughout the day when things are happy, or even tough, things will get better. Change the bind, change the behavior. So we leave you with that. Um, if you have any questions, we can discuss later on and in, in between. Next month, we will be talking again about the vocation, the profession, and society. I believe Daniel will be the 23rd of...